Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank the Japan um, Center for International Exchange and AFLAC for inviting me to speak here this afternoon. Um, it's awesome. And that is how to work towards gender equality in the workplace. But of course, allow me to make a few comments on TPP. The TPP agreement is a huge accomplishment, particularly when you take into account how many issues were addressed, how many countries were involved, and other challenges that we, the negotiators, faced. It's a true testament to US-Japan cooperation in the economic sphere, where we were able to work together closely on developing high standard rules for the Asia Pacific region for the future. Sure. Having built such a strong relationship with my Japanese counterparts based on mutual respect and trust, and having a shared objective of achieving a high standard TPP. I became really interested in this topic as a result of my career as a trade negotiator because I found myself largely across the negotiating table from men, and mostly Asian men. And I often got the question from audiences, what was it like negotiating with men and Asian men? And that was followed by questions about how I succeeded in my career and what could I share with Asian and Japanese women as they embarked on their careers and climbed up the career ladder? And these are some of the issues I would like to discuss this afternoon. And I'd also like to offer some observations on the critical elements that need to be in play for women to be able to be successful in the workplace. Now, we all negotiate every day of our lives. Um, and negotiating trade agreements has some similarities with other negotiations. The five core skills of, the, I think, being a good trade negotiator are, one, having good problem-solving skills, two, being able to listen, three, being extremely patient, four, being trustworthy, and five, the ability to learn the details. And women are talented in all of these areas, and consequently, they bring many strengths to the negotiating table, particularly the ability to problem solve and listen. And I was struck last week by a comment um, that people recall that Nancy Reagan um, made. You know, she passed away last week. And people, um, a number of years ago, asked her, why she worked so hard um, to advise her husband on whom he should trust on his team and who he should be wary of. And I'm paraphrasing this, but she basically replied that women are more intuitive and they can read people better. And I think that is true and it's another core strength of women at the negotiating table. Yet, it's not all great for women at the negotiating table, and women face unique challenges, and I personally face many challenges um, negotiating in a male-dominated profession. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to learn from the best um, at the U.S. government and at the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. I also had the opportunity to work for and to work with extremely talented people, including many women. And now, as I transition to the issue of gender, of the nine U.S. trade representatives I worked for, three were women, and they were all important mentors and role models for me. Now, while the U.S. has made enormous strides in promoting women to senior level positions in the public and private sectors, we still have our work cut out for us. So the point I'm trying to make is that while Japan deals with these issues, it's not alone as it works to promote women in leadership positions. The U.S. stands side by side with Japan in this important endeavor. And all that has been done um, and written in this area, I would like to share with you today five important elements that I believe are critical. First. Um, what needs to be seen in this area is really a senior level commitment from senior leadership that gender equality is a priority issue. 
Senior leaders need to send a strong signal about their commitment to gender equality in order to promote action and change. And Prime Minister Abe has been clear and consistent in this regard. He has made it clear that women are valuable members to the Japanese economy and need to be integrated more fully into the, pri into the private and public sectors of Japan. That values each and every person is the ultimate growth strategy. Active participation by women lies at the core of this and continues to be the greatest challenge. Abenomics is womenomics and creating a society in which all women shine is essential for growth. And in the United States, we've also seen a top-level commitment from our leader. At the Fourth World Conference of Women, President Obama said last fall, women's empowerment and their full participation on the basis of equality in all spheres of society, including participation in the decision-making process and access to power, are fundamental for the achievement in equality, development, and peace. And this leads me to the second element I would like to touch upon today, and that is ensuring that senior level commitments are backed up by laws and regulations that promote change. With the reporting requirements for companies with employees over 300 people. And for those companies, they will need to present data on their current employment situation including how many women they, um, they have um, in their employment force. And they also need to publish kind of their plan, an action plan. President Obama has been a strong advocate for female, female empowerment. Um, and, and there are a number of areas where he has taken enormous steps um, to put those words into action. But one key area that's more prevalent in Japan is the long, very long work hours. And I believe that one of the best things that Japan can do, if it's indeed committed to promoting women in the workforce, is to cut back on the number of hours employees are expected to stay in the office. The OECD estimates that men spend <clears throat> an average of 24 minutes per day on household work, compared to women spending 199 minutes in Japan. This contrasts with the United States, where our numbers aren't great either, but they're better than Japan, <laughs> where women spend a little more than two hours and men spend 82 minutes. And this quickly spread around the office and it set an example for others to follow without risk of skepticism. So these are some great examples of senior level executives taking actions to rewrite the culture of the workplace and setting a positive role model in the office. And while there's no doubt that more can be done throughout the public and private sectors in the United States, I believe their actions are offering a way forward for change. And a third area I would just like to comment on in terms of change um, in culture in the workplace is the whole issue of promoting technology. Um, and I believe that technology can be used in ways, and is being used, but can be used in many more ways to provide more flexibility in the workplace and in the work schedule. But changing the culture of the workplace is extremely hard, and if this isn't complicated enough, the fourth element I'd like to share with you today is that it's important that changes also be made to the cultural norms that go beyond the workplace. But over the past 40 years, this has changed in the United States, and I believe that women in the U.S now can really make the choice more easily about whether they want to stay in the workforce, enter the workforce, or they want to be a full-time mother at home without society judging them one way or the other. And finally, the fifth element I'd like to share with you today is that I believe that part of the, is part of the mix, um, it's important to have what I call support mechanisms for women in the workplace. And this includes things like mentoring, experience sharing, networking, and training. And they're all with the goal of providing women the support they need in order to be successful in the workplace. And this is where mentor and role models come in, 
women in leadership roles provide much needed a resource for junior staff level people who are seeking guidance on the pathways to management. So allow me to conclude today by saying the road to gender equity in the workplace is a long and bumpy road, both for the Japan, for the United States, and for other countries. And I have learned that firsthand through my career, but I am confident that if we talk about the issues openly, and we work together, and we remain committed and open to change, we can make significant strides. And I would conclude and just emphasize that the whole issue of gender equality and women's empowerment is not just a women's issue. It's not just good for women, but it's good for men, it's good for the society, and it's good for the economy. And by taking this issue head on, I believe Japan has an enormous opportunity to showcase its accomplishments and progress to others in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much.